out for me and our different conversations that we've had. Joy, silence, and safety. So I wanted to start um, first with this conversation of silence and voice. And um, wanted to hear you all talk about what is the price of our silence? Does anyone know? <laughs> Do you want to start, Marissa? It's a huge price that we have. Um, I think about Audre Lorde, who says that you cannot hide behind your silence, mm -hmm. that our silence is uh, an opportunity that we become complicit um, in the act of violence against women. And I think that it's important um, for us to recognize that our culture basically has provided the opportunity for us to be silent. Mm -hmm. And so when we were having a conversation about this, I started thinking that I was 30 years old when Anita Hill um, was uh, being um, brought before Congress um, regarding uh, Justice Thomas. And at that time, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I never even thought about uh, harassment in terms of something that was um, something that you know, could uh, help someone to lose a job. Right? I had experienced harassment in the workforce often, and it never dawned on me. And it was a wake-up call. It was like I was conditioned to be silent. Like, that's just the way it is. Bueno, ¿cuál es el precio del silencio? Eh, para las comunidades latinas inmigrantes que venimos de experiencia de, no venimos de una cultura de la denuncia, ¿verdad? Ve, hemos experimentado regímenes muy severos como dictaduras militares donde hablar era, significaba morir. So for Latin American immigrant population, um, our experience is that often we come from cultures of a great deal of, of domination, military dictatorships where uh, talking is the same thing as dying. If you speak out, that can lead to your death. Y lo mismo estamos viviendo ahora con este ambiente y con este nuevo clima político, pues las mujeres también siguen teniendo muchísimo miedo a hablar de qué es lo que está pasando por miedo a, a migración. And now I have to say in the culture today, we also have the kind of political climate where women have a great deal, deal of fear about speaking out, uh, often because of their situation of immigration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come in? No, I want to keep silent. Okay. About silent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what they've said is... Okay. We also know that there's a cost of speaking up, and we, we spoke about that. And how do we help women who know that they have to hide behind this silence, that it's not always a choice? Mm -hmm. I think that we're, from a privileged space, we can say, you have a choice to speak up. And even from a privileged space, we can judge a woman and say, she could, she should. It should be easy for her. But it's not, we know it's not that way. Mm -hmm. So what, so how do we, um, how do we help? Like how do we move, how do we open it up for women to be able to speak about what's happening to them? I think that what we're seeing in the national uh, lexicon right now, uh, we're seeing that more women are speaking up because someone started and say, hey, this is what happened to me. And it gives permission for others to speak up. But it's also very important to note again, that those individuals need to be safe, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in the home place, whether it be um, in social organizations, that we need to make sure that there are resources um, that are available for those individuals. And we also have to um, recognize that there is often, um, more often than not, um, an element of trauma that is involved. And so you have a dual track of you know, am I safe? Is it safe for me to speak up? And who and how will I be protected? 
Eh, la pregunta es que nos hay esos caminos seguros para andar. Bueno, eh, para las mujeres latinas inmigrantes, eh, el, el solo hecho de, de, de llegar a, a un nuevo espacio geográfico ayuda un poco, claro, sin la migra alrededor, ¿verdad? Eh, pero las mujeres han aprendido y hemos aprendido nosotras como activistas con ellas a, a entrar en un proceso de denuncia. Aquí como que es un poquito más fácil, no siempre, pero sí eh, aprendemos a que eh, denunciar es importante y nos puede ir mejor. So for Latin American immigrant women, a new geographic area sometimes helps uh, coming here to the United States, immigration authority aside, uh, we learn, and as activists, we learn alongside of the women to go ahead and make that report, to go ahead and talk about what's happening. And in a certain way, it's easier here. Pero una de las cosas que más ayuda a las mujeres a denunciar es el tener una institución o una organización detrás de ellas apoyándolas. But one of the things that will be most helpful for women when they're trying to make the decision to speak out or not is whether or not there's an institution or an organization behind them that's going to look out for their, for their interests. Mm -hmm. Y en el modelo específico con el que trabajamos en la clínica del pueblo, eh, trabajamos con promotoras que son mujeres, aliadas, compañeras, guías, que acompañan a las mujeres en, en cualquier proceso con servicios legales, servicios clínicos, y el tener a una otra, a una compañera, a una amiga solidaria al lado, también eso ayuda muchísimo. And one of the ways we work at the Clinica del Pueblo is that we have a model that's based on uh, promoters, promotoras, and those are, they're women, they're allies, they're mm -hmm. companions, they're guides, and so when women go through a process where they have to have legal services or clinical services, it helps to have some woman who is next to her helping her go through that process. Este acto de sororidad realmente ayuda un poco en, en un proceso no muy corto, por supuesto. So that action of sisterhood helps a lot in this whole process, which is not a short process, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love so much about the Clothesline Project is that it is, it allows a lot of entry points, right, for us to come together and that women don't have to go through this alone. In your process of working with survivors, how, how important is it for them to hear and to be able to be with someone and have that person walk with them? ¿Qué tan importante es estar acompañada? Bueno, es, es esto de, de tener la sororidad y la solidaridad del otro y de la otra, que no solamente te va a apoyar con interpretación, no solamente te, te está apoyando para que tengas los documentos juntos al momento de ir a una corte, sino que es la compañía humana, ¿verdad? El estar en... El, eh, el lo colectivo, el estar con otra y con otro, eso da un poco más de fuerza para las mujeres. It's the kind of thing, the sisterhood and the solidarity from others is, is key. Um, not only might you have someone there to help you with interpretation, you might have someone to help you get your documents ready for court, um, it, but it's also that human aspect, just feeling like you are a company, that you are together in this collective process. Mm -hmm. And how do you find sisterhood showing up in the healing process at the Living Well? Right, so I just want to um, share that the Living Well participated in the Baltimore ceasefire movement last weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, Baltimore was ranked number seven as the de one of the deadliest cities by Forbes magazine. In September, there was 31 homicides. I think in um, October, there was 30. And so um, activists by the name of Erica Bridgeforth you know, came out with a suggestion and a call to action for the city. And she said, let's um, do 72 hours of no one killing you. Mm -hmm. And so it sounded so very you know, simple and also a little bit hokey, but it actually 
gained worldwide attention. And, and in that, there was the Baltimore Peace Challenge. And the Peace Challenge was really about, you know, how do you provide, again, resources for individuals that have experienced violence, right, or survivors of violence? And how do we have conversations about uh, mediation and resolving conflict in different ways? And um, more importantly, that we are not individually and collectively acting violent in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And so the Living Well took up a healing and community um, afternoon or day, if you will, and we included the Elton Darrell Clothesline Project. And, and as a part of that process, you know, we wanted to provide what we called healing technologies to those individuals that came out to participate. And so whether that be a meditation, we used a homotherapy, which is you know, fire meditation. We um, did qigong and yoga. And we introduced you know, healing uh, methodologies such as the Virtues Project, et cetera. And so one of the things that um, Monica, I think, spoke to when we were at the first session is that, you know, uh, one of my questions was, well, how do we reclaim our joy? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we heal through this? And what does joy look like? Uh, we had a very interesting conversation yesterday that Monica was saying, you know, healing and joy maybe shows up in different ways for different people, mm -hmm. right? So at the Living Well, um, we are devoted to soulful expression, conscious expansion, and optimal wellness. And so we really are focusing on what we know as trauma-informed care or trauma-responsive services to help people to understand that even talking about this, even sitting there uh, and sitting in space with people responding to the questions on the ballots that we understood that people could be triggered in telling those stories and you know how do we create a safe space and making sure that they feel space that feel safe um, in their sharing right and that their sharing may uh, create a trigger for other individuals that are in the space and so we make sure that we're always saying to folks that you're safe here and that we got you, right? That we are going to operate in sisterhood and we're gonna provide resources just as, as little as showing up for one another um, for those individuals. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? I think people underestimate the power of joy the same mm -hmm. way they underestimate the power of art. Mm -hmm. And um, when someone is going into the arts, we don't always look at it as you can use it as a tool to heal other people. But in watching you all go through this process, using art as a tool to approach trauma, mm -hmm. it opened up things for both of you all. And so Monica, you got the, the, the question of joy, but then they also got this opportunity to use art. So tell us, how did using art as the entry point for approaching trauma, how did that shift your process and how did it inform the work that you do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Para nosotras, eh, esto es algo bastante nuevo y muchísimas gracias, Mónica. Eh, estábamos pensándolo hace un par de años, pero eh, el arte sí que es uno de los mecanismos que, que están ayudando a las mujeres. Y esta experiencia nos ha abierto eh, este nuevo camino para poder intervenir en, en el trauma de las mujeres sobrevivientes. So for us, this is something new, and thank you very much, Monica, for providing this entry point. Um, it's been a few years now that we've been thinking about art as a way of helping women, and it's really been a way um, that has helped build a, a new path forward to help uh, get past or to deal with some of the trauma of the survivors. Porque la, la mujeres migrantes latinas que, que, que llegan a nuestros grupos son mujeres que están en, en el enajenamiento del trabajo, ¿verdad? Porque vienen en condiciones extremas de pobreza y lo que quieren es conectarse con trabajo, ¿verdad? Mujeres que tienen segunda y triple jornada de trabajo. Entonces hay una enajenación por el trabajo, trabajo, trabajo y, y esto de darse un chance para cosas como conectarse con el arte, aunque tenemos mucho arte, ¿verdad? O conectarnos con las, las técnicas que son complementarias de aromaterapia. Eso es bien difícil en una mujer trabajadora, pobre y migrante. 
So for Latin American migrant women um, who ex experience extreme alienation in the workplace, and they come from situations of extreme poverty, and they're working two or three shifts here, it's all work, work, work. Um, so to have this other possibility of connecting with themselves and healing through art, that becomes something that's a really, really important space. Um, and the other techniques, aromatherapy, all kinds of healing methods have been important, um, but it's a new space for us. Pero este espacio nos nos ha hecho un llamado de atención y estamos ya conectándonos con todas las mujeres artistas latinoamericanas que tenemos aquí del sur de América, mujeres que cosen maravilloso, mujeres que trabajan la lana de una manera increíble. Y aquí en el área tenemos muchas artistas y ahora estamos como repuntando hacia ese lado. Muchas gracias. And we're really starting to look at the area of art a whole lot more now because um, Latin American women, there, there are, is a lot of art um, and we have a lot of South American women artists in the area, women who sew amazingly. We have women who know how to work with wool. Um, so this is a whole area that we're really wanting to get to get into more, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you want to, how will you take this question of joy? Is this going to be, is this now a part of it? Are you going to continue with that question? <coughs> with the question of joy and something that was mentioned right, right now, that how we are, in, in both of your cases, like being with each other, like accompanying each other. And I think for me the question is how we, this, this like big, uh, we're sort of finding, this big uh, a a moment where in the media we're talking about it, mm -hmm. how do we interweave that mm. in being there for each other? How can, how can we do that? I was remembering throughout this talk at one point when the feminicide started in the north of Mexico, in, in Ciudad Juarez, uh, the first ones to talk about it were the Chicana artists in Los Angeles. And then there was a big uh, uh, organization of women from Hollywood, uh, including Jane Fonda, et cetera, who even went to Ciudad Juarez. And it was like a little moment. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I don't know how to put these two worlds together, like the, of the little moments that make media and a lot of attention and that are the tipping points. Mm -hmm. And then how do we really tip the point well by having the, by it being this close thing, everyday thing, accompanying, which really re-educates us and really educates us and really mm -hmm. makes us not just think about it, but live it in a different, in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that will give me a lot of joy. That would be giving me that a lot of joy. It's <laughs> um, and you were talking about like the times of today. At how do we leverage these times? I mean, we're saying we need to tip the point. What is it going to take? You've been doing this work for 40 years, and to me, that's inspiring because I'm like, okay, all right, we must move the needle. But what what will it take? What what do we have to bring to to, keep, to leverage these times today? I always think it's a process of very deep education. Mm -hmm. We have to re-educate ourselves as women. Men have to re-educate themselves. And then we have to, what was the word you used yesterday when we were talking a bit about this? Bystanders? How are we as Bystander a society? Culture. Yeah. How mm -hmm. do we not let this happen to the other person without even turning around? Mm -hmm. Which I think we still do very much in, in, in every kind of situation. Mm -hmm. There's so much going on in the world that it's hard to to focus on things, but how do we how do we not let this happen to other people? Mm -hmm. In the I mean, when we're in the public transport, where we, when we're at the work, when we're wherever we are, no, be there really for each other. Mm -hmm. And it can be scary, I suppose, yeah. mm -hmm. and it takes doing it. But I think education will be a way of mm -hmm. of doing it. I, I would have a lot more trust. I would like to have. Uh, uh, museums be places of education and mm -hmm. schools be places of education mm -hmm. and the media have other kinds of programs because we have to change in a very, very deep way. 40 years has not been enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just, uh, to your point, I think that we have to redress the lexicon um, in our popular culture. And one of the things that I thought was, uh, for me, um, um, an experience uh, while we were doing our project is that there were men and women uh, at all age groups coming up and the men kind of felt like, oh, that's not for me. And I said, yes, it is. I said, let's, you know, 
uh, join the conversation. I would like for you um, to share your voice in this. And I could tell that it was just kind of like a swirl, like, I don't know, you know, I don't know this is, you know, what's my voice? It was just kind of this awakening that you could feel. And I also think that we have a huge opportunity for young people, and especially around popular culture and music, um, to use um, music and, um, and cultural arts as an opportunity to have conversations about our value systems around this topic, right? Mm -hmm. Our values drive our behavior and we catch our values. Uh, we're not taught our values so much as we catch our values. And we catch it through um, the media and you know, what, you know, what happens if uh, Clarence Thomas is still appointed to, you know, the, to, you know, to um, the Supreme Court and, you know, if our commander in chief is still, you know, wins the election and, you know, on and on and on, I think that it's important to recognize that, you know, we're, that's coding, right? You know, we are coding the environment like, you see what happened, nothing happened. They're just circling the wagons, right? And so is it worth it? Is it worth it? So I, again, I think that the, the solution is, is that we have to, you know, do some creative placemaking, if you will, around the subject in a way that people um, don't feel that they are being um, uh, attacked, if you will, or if they're, you know, that you're asking them to do something that may cause them harm, whether it be re-traumatized or what, and being triggered, or whether um, they feel that they're no longer safe in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yo creo que que una de las mejores vías para para el trabajo contra la violencia de género es volviendo este asunto una responsabilidad de todos y de todas. I think one of the best ways of looking at how to get to this gender violence and stopping gender violence is making it everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. No solamente de los artistas, no solamente de las instituciones, not just artists, no not solamente just de los estados cuando los estados lo asumen, sino que es una responsabilidad colectiva e individual. Not just artists, not just institutions, not just the governments when the governments are willing to take them up, but it's a collective responsibility as well as an individual responsibility. Entonces, todas y todos tenemos una tarea, ¿verdad? En, en la casa, en la escuela, en la calle, eh, a través de los medios eh, masivos de comunicación o los medios Twitter, eh, WhatsApp y todas estas cosas, Facebook <laughs> existen, que no soy tan familiar con esto, pero esta, eh, esto es, es una responsabilidad de todas y de todos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all of us, um, men and women, when we're in the house, we're in school, we're on the street, uh, we're on social media, we're using Twitter and WhatsApp and Facebook, I don't really know how to use those very well yet, but um, <laughs> it's a responsibility wherever we are um, for all of us, men and women, to be working on this issue. Mm -hmm. I think we have to silence the shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that we're in a situation where we're speaking to the choir a bit. Mm -hmm. There are some mm -hmm. people in this audience who um, have done a lot of work uh, in the field, that are studying the field. So um, it typically, instead, like at these kind of discussions, there will be audience where it will say, do you have questions? But I would like to propose, do you have some answers? Um, do you want to share the questions you're wrestling with, not even expecting to get an answer? Um, we know that y'all are doing the work, right? I, I looked at the list, I'm, I'm a little bit extra, I research people, y'all are doing the work. <laughs> and there's some people that were specially invited. So what are some things that you are working with in your field? What are you using? What are some tools that are working where you are? Does anybody want to share that? From the back, all the way in the back. Hi, I'm a poet and performance artist, and I appreciate the conversation today around using the arts and sisterhood and support and 
community-based programs, but what I haven't heard and I think is really critical in terms of making any forward movement, uh, because everything that's happening right now is going to be, they're gonna to try to dismantle it, right? So white supremacy, misogyny, this culture that we live in, it exists because it's been allowed to exist and they're gonna fight back and they're gonna to try to dismantle this Me Too movement and everything that we're talking about here today. So I was reading about, I was reading an article about a woman named Catherine McKinnon, who's, a, I think she's a law professor. She teaches law at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And she's been fighting this fight for 40 years. And uh, she said that uh, her advice is if women want real change, uh, we need to fight for codified rights in the form of an equal rights amendment. So we also need to be, we need to be talking about law, right, yeah. and legal protection. Because in order, one thing that stops us from coming forward is our fear of uh, retaliation, our fear, uh, our privacy issues. So how, the law has to come into this conversation and how, do, how are we gonna change laws? Absolutely. Who in the room is working in policy? Anyone working in policy? So that's another thing that we have to do, and I'll have to, we'll have to make it out a part of our initiative, getting people that are working in policy in the room. A lot of times at a museum, we, or we want to think that it's only for art. So how do we make sure that someone is in policy knows that this conversation is for you, mm -hmm. that you're supposed to be here because we have to do that work as well. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and sometimes, if, if I'm doing my part and you're doing your part as a poet and you all are doing your part serving the community, then when we have these conversations, if there's another part that we need, we get to put it on the table. So I thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing that. Is there anyone else that has wants to talk about a solution or bring up what's missing from the conversation? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really like how um, you brought up the fact that um, education is the answer. And I think that um, one thing that I think is missing in a lot of public schools is consent education. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that a lot of times you don't understand that you've been harassed or assaulted. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they expect uh, parents or guardians to teach and sometimes even they don't understand or they don't feel comfortable. So. I think it's important to bring in educators um, on, you know, um, we were talking about this on the bus, healthy sexuality, um, consent education, because I think in making it a law that consent education has to be taught, um, not only in high school, but also mm -hmm. in elementary yeah. and middle school, um, because I think that's the only way to make a change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before, I want you to answer that question here. Is there anyone in the room that can offer one example of how we can teach consent? I have a five-year-old. How do I teach consent to a five-year-old? Well, I know um, one way that um, I interned with the Maryland Coalition at Sexual Assault, and we talk about that, you know, just saying, like, you know, a lot of times kids will be asked, will be, will say, give them a hug, give them a hug. It's like, do you want to give them a hug? It's okay if you don't want to give them a hug. Mm -hmm. um, there's also really good, I mean, everyone knows about, like a lot of people know about the T consent, but there's also one about, um, I think it has to do with like a bicycle. But I think that's the most important thing is saying that you don't have to, you know, if you, little kids are always taught, you know, or, you know, say hello to this person or be polite, you know, and I think we're taught that as young women too. Um, so that's one way. That's good. That's good. Uh, what a fantastic suggestion. I think that's so important. I just wanted to say that uh, there's a podcast called Women's Media Hour Live with Robin Morgan. And Robin Morgan is a feminist from the 70s, and she has these, she's, has this incredible show, Women's Media Hour Live with Robin Morgan podcast, um, where she brings in women leaders from all around the world, and they talk 
brilliant solutions. Like it's the it's a take on the news that you never get. It's world class. Really recommend it. But I listened to this podcast a few months ago, and she had somebody on from New York City, and I don't remember her name, but it was about four months ago. And this woman, young white woman, Jessica, somebody, she had been working with trying to uh, implement like. What basically what she was saying was a big revelation to me. She said there are a lot of laws against harassment that just don't get um, they don't get implemented. And she she was looking at it from the point of view of like the city prosecutor in New York, and from that from the prosecutor's point of view, they don't want to mess around with implementing the law. And so if somebody comes to the prosecutor's office, if a couple of women come in and say we want you to start you know, implementing this law, then the city prosecutor will start to do it, but they need pressure from their constituents to actually implement the law that exists. So I found this an eye opener and it's, her name is on Women's Media, Media Hour with Robin Morgan podcast. For those that, we do have a resource page on the website and if you email us with a resource, we can add it to that page as well. We have one person in the middle right here with one. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that this is something that we can all do without a program, without a law, without a policy, mm -hmm. and that's to start referring to ourselves as strong, as smart, as capable, and not, I'm sorry, not nasty. The qualities that we refer to mm -hmm. as ourselves are what people are going to see us as. So you have a little girl, you have a little boy, teach them to speak of themselves as not bitches, not bastards, not anything negative. Mm -hmm. Teach your children to speak of themselves and think of themselves as strong, smart, capable. We can do it. I can do it, you can do it, anybody can do it, you don't need a law. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have to say. Hmm. Does any, so uh, I wanted, with self-worth, and then also, because there's brought up two things there. Conversation of self-worth, but then also the conversation of being able to define yourself and how you describe yourself. Does anyone I want to come up? How does that come up in your spaces, giving women and people their power to define how they use language for themselves? Did you, you want to go ahead? Hi. I'm an artist and an educator. Uh, I've been dealing with feminist issues for almost two decades. Um, I do, address, into the mic. I, do, I address language particularly, yeah. um, and visual imagery as an art photographer and installation artist. Um, I teach at the University of North Carolina, where HB2 was passed, uh, a law uh, requiring um, transgender students to use restrooms that um, aligned with the way that they were born. This was very disruptive, obviously very uh, difficult for a lot of students. Um, I teach photography in the art department, and I also teach um, in the Honors College. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what I'm teaching, I teach my students, we spend several weeks uh, unpackaging media images. And I'll say this, um, the first day of class I tell all of my students, um, I don't want anyone adding to the canon of oppressive imagery. And we will spend all semester unpackaging what that means. Mm -hmm. So we do that. We read all kinds of images in regard to gender and race constructions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I allow an open dialogue. Uh, midway through the semester, um, I ask each student in the class, you know, how is media representing you visually, and how does that make you feel? And we go around the room, and it's sort of an open forum. So this is sort of an intervention of mine that I uh, enact with students um, in the, at the university setting every day. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have to say this, I'm from California, so I'm sort of born into a time and a place when I believe in beautiful life, you know. And I find myself now living in the third civil rights town of infamy. And I don't believe I'm there by accident. So um, it's my purpose to, to open this dialogue every day. And I think we have to communicate. Again, every day, one to one, or within groups and talk about it and help people understand and think. Because not only are we dealing with media images, 
We're dealing with racism and misogyny that's inherent mm -hmm. within our language. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. So we have to unpackage all of them. That's a start. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all the way in the back. Thank you. Good evening. Um, and if I may, and this has kind of just come to mind as we are engaging in this discussion, and I'll speak from the perspective of a parent. I have um, a 13-year-old and I have 11-year-old twins. So as we're talking in the context of <coughs> answers, I know for me, particularly here lately, as literally every day we're hearing of a new story that's coming out of Hollywood, um, I've challenged myself to have more conversations with my children and for me particularly, you know, we tend to focus as parents on the blatant, the most obvious um, mm -hmm. acts of violation. Mm -hmm. But we also have to define what it looks like, even, the, even in the most subtle um, ways, what it looks like so that our kids can discern when something happens to them that's not appropriate, that is wrong, they know what that looks like and they know how to respond accordingly. The other thing too, when you talk about empowerment, I've even realized myself that while I engage my daughters and my son in conversations regarding um, what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, at the same time, I also need to share my own personal experiences with them mm -hmm. of having dealt with the very instances that I'm instructing them in terms of how to deal with. I also need to share with them what I've dealt with so that they don't feel like it's something that they should be ashamed of in the event that they have a similar experience. Mm -hmm. And they also need to see that I feel empowered enough to be able to speak to them about um, those experiences specifically. In addition, I've also challenged um, their father to engage more in these conversations. Growing up, my mom was the one that broached that conversation with my siblings and I. My father was present, but we never had those conversations with him. But I also think that it's very important for men to be a part of the conversation um, and to make it clear that they feel as though it's unacceptable as well. So, you know, that is a um, big deal. That leaves a lasting impression. It can't just be the women, you know what I mean, that's constantly lending a voice. There's a huge gap, there's a huge disparity when it, when it comes to um, men lending a voice until such time as something occurs. Now you see a lot of men that are speaking out, oh, that's disgusting, oh, that's this, oh, that's that. But where was your voice prior to, proactively, before these types of stories come to life? Thank you. Thank you. Ray, I'm gonna, can you lift up the house lights a little bit can more? Can I mention yeah. something? Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the Tendedero, it's become also a, a place for, for men to participate in many ways. Uh, a lot of men suffer harassment as well, not, mm -hmm. as, as, not as many as women definitely, mm -hmm. but I find that they have even a harder time talking about it, just as they have a harder time talking, doing things about their health mm -hmm. and doing things about all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I think men have to talk more, not just about mm -hmm. how, how they've been educated to treat women. That's also something I talk about often with men who see that then they, they don't, well, when did they teach you to act like that with women? And they'll come and tell me, well, when I was in grammar school, a boy came and spanked a girl, and the teacher sort of went, no, you're a conqueror. And, and how, do we, how do we, I think men have to have their conversation, but not just in regard to women, but in regard to themselves and how sexism affects them as well. It's, it's really messing us both up. One of the largest growing population of people that are committing suicide in the United States are white male. And we have to ask the question of how is this system impacting people's mental health? Like where are men? There are men in the room, so I'm not, I don't want to speak for you. So if you, um, can we lift the, the lights from up top, take them down a little bit, just so we can see the audience a little bit more. I'm having a problem seeing everybody. But if there's something that you want to speak on, please do. Um, <coughs> thank you. I have a question or an observation that I think goes before what we're talking about specifically. I'm from Mexico, um, and I have two kids. Uh, back then, Vivian was seven and Sebastian was nine. And I had to have a conversation with them from the bus. Um, we go to Montgomery Co uh, Co County Public Schools um, about what rape was because all Mexicans were rapists, according to our, our candidate for the presidency. And it was an interesting conversation to have, but I think that what I would have wished is that 
when defining something, the way I explain it to my kids is every generalization has an exception. So when anyone in the world tells you something is equal to that, they're probably, they're missing something. We, we, instead of trying to go directly into criticizing, or I mean, it was very tricky, very, very tricky. But what I was left with is, why only Mexicans? Because then when you separate, I think in the United States it's very easy, and I think it happens also in Mexico. When you separate, you, you are trying to divide people, and then we're less <coughs> powerful together. And I, I wish there was uh, more, I spoke about it in social media, I spoke about what, how I handle it, but I think that there's also a sense of, it's easy for us to feel separated because we speak different languages, because we have different heritages, mm -hmm. but we all are living in a very similar environment. Mm -hmm. So if we can preview the we before the, what were you coming from, or what box do you have to you know, put mm -hmm. in? Because my kids have never had to choose until that moment. They never had to see themselves as American or Mexican until they were pointed to. And because they were, they were never asked to do that before. Mm -hmm. I've never taught them that that is something we do. We are first humans mm -hmm. and then we are from where we come. Mm -hmm. So I think that because there is power in separating us, mm -hmm. that is something that we all can easily do in every way of how we treat each other and how we speak about other people. Mm -hmm. Because of the African American community, every time I'm like, well, they have very similar issues than we do. Mm -hmm. We have, I mean, I'm sure we, we have more things in common that would separate us, right? But we are not constantly having that conversation of the mm -hmm. unity that, that you know, we have as humans, mm -hmm. regardless if we're female or male or transgender, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that is something I think that is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Larissa? Mm -hmm. Right, and to your point, um, we just recently at The Living Well uh, formed what we call a sister power circle for women of color um, because as a management consultant, I, I do coaching, more often I'm hearing these kinds of, of issues and people don't have a place to, uh, to place them. There's no portal to talk about these issues, you know, that whether they come up in the home place, they come up in the workplace, they come up in the social organization. So I think that one of the things that is important for us to do in our communities is to create circles you know, to create safe spaces for people to come and to be able to speak about it. And also, you know, those kind of issues that we know create mental, psychological, physical trauma and, you know, um, toxic stress, right? And so that is a, uh, a byproduct of what you're talking about. And we have to create healing spaces um, so that we can feel space, feel safe, I'm sorry, and have a opportunity to uh, provide each other with resources <coughs> and tactics and strategies of how do you respond to the, the, the uh, points that you're making, right? I think we also, uh, I just wanna add to that, I think we need to stop lying and we need right. to stop distancing. Mm -hmm. We have this notion that if you do the right thing, say the right thing, uh, be, are in the right place, wear the right thing, um, mm -hmm. that somehow you, that nothing can happen to you. Or that even if you use the right words to describe yourself, put yourself in the right places, mm -hmm. a lot of people have done all those things and we see that it's still a problem. So it's easy to distance yourself and say, well, no, not in my house over there with those people and their issues mm -hmm. when the reality of it is that mm -hmm. where it happens the most is in, in the house and yeah. mm -hmm. in in your place. home with the people that you know and so it's a comfort to lie it makes mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's a covering so we talk about women being silent but we don't also talk about the other the way the the, the lies that are silencing that, that if you, it could not have happened if you were where you were supposed to be, being who you were supposed to be, and doing what I told you to do. Well, it did, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes for, I know some of my girlfriends that were never in the right place, always doing the wrong thing, those nasty women, sometimes ain't nothing happened to them. You know, so it's like, you know, we have to get away from it being over there. It is right here with each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. And until it's right here on your block, in your house, in your bed, on your sheets, in your kitchen, in your food, then mm -hmm. we can't connect with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what we get to do. We get to connect. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because it's everywhere. So once we realize it's everywhere and we stop lying about that, I think we'll experience a different kind of connection with each other. Mm -hmm. so. um, what was profound for me reading the ballad, <coughs> Um, a lot of the people that came through the Living Well doing the healing and community event were young people. Mm -hmm. And I was just blown back by how many young people wrote that they had been sexually violated. It was, I mean, it was an, an enormous amount that indicated that. And I thought, you know, because it was, you know, we didn't watch what everyone wrote and they put it up on the um, clothesline. But I felt a sense of, no, 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 come back, come back. We need to talk. I need to find you a resource. I need to, you know, get some of the um, mental health and the clinicians that we work with um, in community to come and sit in space, right? We need to really kind of reshift that model of, um, you know, I always say at the Living Well that we use these healing practices because many of the people that we're trying to reach are not going to call their um, uh, uh, EAP um, uh, officer and get a mental health consult. That's just not going to happen. And we have to find alternative ways to help people to restore the joy and to begin a healing process and to recognize that this did happen and that it's okay to say that this is what happened to me. Monica, you've taken this clothesline project a lot of places. Um, what are the commonalities of wherever you take it? Is it do you find that if you're in a, a completely affluent neighborhood or this demographic, does the when people write on those ballots, does a lot change? At least they're able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And this silence that we were talking about at the mm -hmm. beginning is suspended for a little while. And I'll get people who say, this happened to me 40 years ago and I had never talked about it. Or I just noticed it right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that it, it starts processes that, that go. It's not something you can measure mm -hmm. qualitatively. It's some, I mean, quantitatively, it's something that, that changes in, in, in the way you perceive yourself and then hopefully mm -hmm other things happen. Mm -hmm. in, in that same way, I was, I was just thinking right now as I was hearing, I don't remember your name, de Mexico, back there. Mm -hmm. uh, what a terrible situation to have to explain to your children what rape mm -hmm. is because you're being accused of a rape. And I suddenly mm -hmm. find that I'm very, uh, my, my work at home is to criticize the situation and the <laughs> violence women live in. Mm -hmm. But I hope I have not contributed to ha you having an image of what goes on in Mexico, which is happening here as well, yeah. you know? But somehow or other, it might be easy to distance it. But I just want to make that very, very clear, you know? I also know that there's, how do you say trata de blancas, particularly here in Washington? And uh, trata de blancas, human trafficking. Human trafficking. Uh, human trafficking. The, 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 there's human traffic, and I know there's feminicides, and I know that, that in this city and in other cities, those things are going on as, as, mm -hmm. as well, and there's incest, and there's rape at home, and there's rape at universities, and there's this whole, whole culture. And, and yes, it happens in Mexico, but no, it doesn't happen to everyone. And yes, it's something we're fighting against, and probably proportionally happens, unfortunately, in the same proportion that it happens mm -hmm. everywhere. So, uh, so I, hope, I hope I didn't blow it by being critical. <laughs> Maybe I should have come to say here in the States like another version yeah. of, of things, but uh, bueno, I just wanted to mention that, no? I think there's a strange beauty, and that's maybe where we can get to the joy. There is something um, interesting when you realize that you are in a boat with other people trying to get to the same place that are completely different from you. and like. There's joy in connectivity. There's joy in not being by yourself. And, and that's why it's so important for us to connect that way and find that joy. Um, we're about to wrap up, and I just wanted to, if there's any one nugget, any one thing that you wanted to leave us with, um, Monica. This part of being together and being there for, for each other and, and really taking care every day to find situations in which we can be supportive of other of other people. I think uh, we have a culture of support and <coughs> we'll, we don't even need to change the laws. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're necessary, but we need to change this human culture. humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And please invite people to participate in the Tendedero and please use it as you want. 
if you want to use it in different contexts, I'm more than happy about that. Well, I want to thank you all thank you. so much for what you all have uh, given to us and thank the audience. Um, if there are other resources that you're working with, please email us, let us know. Um, <coughs> online, we also have where you can participate. We have a digital Tenderero. I don't know if it's the first digital one or not, but um, you can go online and you can answer the questions there. We'll print them out and add them. Um, I'm hungry, <laughs> and I know that you all are too. Thank you so much for contributing to the conversation. I thought the event was very interesting. I've never participated in anything like this from an artistic perspective on how you can look at sexual harassment and violence against women. One of the things that stood out for me is definitely sisterhood and finding joy. This is my first Fresh Talk. It was amazing. It was just a great opportunity to meet with a bunch of amazing women and talk about issues that really impact us. Um, and also to have the artists come and speak was just so, just give, to give insight about the project. It was, yeah, it was a great, great night. Excellently organized. Uh, the food was really good. As a man, hearing uh, how complicit and uh, we're not proactive in engaging and uh, in stopping uh, domestic violence uh, was really enlightening. This is one of my favorite spaces in the city, creative, gorgeous, beautiful. I've participated in this series before, but this is the first time that they've done it with, um, or the first time that I participated in it with the supper. Um, which I thought was amazing. It gave an opportunity to talk amongst some of the attendees in a way that I hadn't been able to do previously and hear their response to um, the panel. So the conversations in addition to the panel discussion were just amazing. So